Hello, welcome to another Key Life session. I hope you are doing well. Let us know on the chat. I am Karina Varela and I'm here today with Alex Porcelli. We're here to talk, actually we're here to hear from an expert about stateless executions with processes and Cogito. So Porcelli, who do we have here with us today? Okay, today we have Thiago Dolfini. He has been working with us for a long time and he, uh, in, the, in the past, he worked on the designer, but it has been a while. He's been working on the Cogito engine. And uh, today we have him to cover one of the new functionalities that we have in Cogito. That is awesome, especially because this is going to be supported also on the enterprise version of the product that is coming on uh, I think until the end of the year, it's out, the 712, and it is going to be the first uh, capability that is going to be related to processes, supported on runtimes, uh, extended, ex, ex, ah, supported by the execution with Cogito runtimes. So awesome. without further ado, hey, Tiago, thank you for joining us today. Hey, hello. It's nice to be here again. Uh, I was last year talking about sagas, and now let's talk about stateless microservices and how we can implement them using Cogito. Oh, awesome. I'm looking forward, especially for the use cases that we can achieve with stateless execution. Sure. Awesome. Um, and uh, I think you can share a screen. I think you're already shared, and you can get it started. OK. Let's see. Yeah, it's fine. Right. Can you see my screen? Uh -huh. Yeah. OK, great. So just as an introduction, uh, so when we think about microservices, a traditional approach or architecture, it's something like this. I mean, we have some clients that could be users or applications of the users or even other microservices trying to communicate with the microservice itself. So in general, we have a load balancer that uh, load balance all the requests to the, the instance that we have run, running for, for the microservices. And uh, the most important part here that uh, I want to emphasize is that we normally we have a database or a persistence layer that is responsible to store the data uh, about the resources that the microservices are running. So going further uh, related to this architecture, uh, this is a more realistic case where we have microservices communicating with each other. And then in this case, if, if you take a look, uh, the microservice should scale the persistence layer as well. So whatever the database uh, we are using in the infrastructure, and it's, not, it's common to have different databases, technologies, we should guarantee that we are scaling the persistence layer together with the the services uh, the, the the instance of the services that are running um, and in general uh, as i put here uh for instance uh, we we could have uh let's imagine a scenario for instance uh, uh order fulfillment process where we can create an order so when we are creating an order we don't have any state so we say oh create an order so the client send a request for the services to create an order and then after the service uh, creates this order, it uh, responses with the ID of that order. And after that, the clients can retrieve getting uh, that order using the given ID that it was created or even updating the order or canceling the order. But all of these operations are based on a previous ID that was created for the order, okay? So, okay, so let's move uh, here. So. So this, this approach that I showed to you, it's basically a stateful approach because we have the states that are persisted in the database, okay? So this is fine, and, this, and to be honest, this is the, the common approach that we have. But on the other hand, we can move and think more on a stateless approach. And what is a stateless approach? It's basically we don't depend on any information of previous requests or previous operations. So each request is independent from each other. So we don't have that, uh, that state, that, that ID, uh, that uh, you can do uh, subsequent requests, OK? So each request is a new request. We don't hear, we, in this way, the, the service don't need to maintain data across different requests. And with this, 
we don't need to to be worried about the persistence so we can totally remove persistence the persistence layer from our architecture okay uh, so there is no need of a centralized database we don't need to to be worried about how to scale the database uh, together with the service and so on and so forth okay uh, and in a stateless approach it's much easier to scale because since we don't have to depend on an external database or an external persistence layer, we can just scale the, the instances of the service. So it's much easier to add or remove instance on demand. So if you have a high demand, so let's imagine uh, the Black Friday scenario where we have a, a high demand to, to scale our services. And then after this, we can scale down so it's much easier in, in a stateless approach. Uh, it's, uh, we, we don't need to take care of different external dependencies on our infrastructure, OK? Another point that I put here, uh, it's basically, it's less complex. I mean, the whole architecture become less complex because we don't need to take care of synchronization points in a distributed way. We, we often call this a distributed locking. So going back to, to this slide, for instance, imagine that we have uh, different services receiving concurrent requests, and then we need to guarantee the consistency of the data. OK, so we, we cannot allow, for instance, a user that is trying to update an order while another request is trying to update the same order in a distributed way. So we need to have a centralized way to guarantee the distributed locking approach. So in, in a stateless um, architecture, we don't need to, to take care of this. And it, it makes things much easier uh, for the developer and so on. Um, with the stateless approach, we say that the requests are self-contained. What I mean with this is basically all the information that we need to, to process a request is on the request itself, on the payload of the request, as a header, uh, parameter, or whatever. So the information is there in that request. And that the, the service should just grab the information and do whatever the, the, the service needs. Okay? Um, another point that it's worth mentioning is that it's much easier to recover or to retry uh, to process a request. So imagine that our service is running and for any reason it fails to process a request. So what the client can do, it's basically to retry. Or even in a microservice architecture, when one service is sending a request to another service, it can retry. It's much easier to retry when we don't have states. Okay. So uh, just a comparison between the two approaches. Uh, in a stateless approach, as I said, the, the requests are independent. So we can send, uh, the clients can send uh, as much requests as, as they need without any uh, constraint regarding previous requests. On a stateful approach, uh, it's common to depend on, on the state of a previous request. So the clients uh, first create an order, as I said before, and then based on the idea of this order that it was created, it sends another uh, request to get information or to cancel the, uh, the, the order or even updating the order. Uh, so that's the, the, the main difference of the, the two approaches. OK, so given this uh, context about what is state, stateful and what is stateless, we have Cogito in, in this area. And what is Cogito? Basically, I'll try to go quickly because we had uh, previous presentations uh, about Cogito. But uh, I, I like to define Cogito as a, a solution or environment that allows developers to build microservices, including business automation capabilities, in an easy way. And so it's very, the idea is to be very easy for developers to start building microservices. And just a quick introduction. Uh, as I said, the Cogito is on the business automate, automation area, and it allows users to use different assets that can communicate with each other. So as an example, we have for, for workflows and processes, we have the BPMN, uh, the serverless workflow that takes care of this area uh, around workflows. We have for decisions, we have DMN and DRLs that it's, uh, it's comfortable with Cogito as well. So it allows user to define the logic in different ways, OK? Uh, so the idea of Cogito is to be developer-centric and provide a friendly uh, interface and APIs and for, for developers to use it, OK? Uh, it provides lightweight runtimes. So the idea is to be, to be very light and to be uh, 
very easy to run in pods and in the cloud environment, so to be very easy to scale. Okay, the the whole uh, architecture of Cogito it's aiming to achieve a distributed architecture. So the idea is to provide multiple microservices communicating and allow users to use it. This infrastructure, let's say, out of the box. Okay. Another point here is that Cogito uh, has the main focus on Quarkus, but it is it's compatible with Spring Boot as well. Okay. Uh, and Cogito provide to, to developers some code generation that uh, while building the process, while the building phase, we generate code, for instance, to provide some REST uh, APIs generation out of the box based on the assets that the user already defined and designed, okay? Uh, another point, it's related to customization. So Cogito provides users and APIs and multiple add-ons that are kind of extensions uh, that uh, allows users to customize the application. So let's say that the user is the designing a process that wants to communicate with Kafka. So we have an add-on that provides Kafka capabilities in Cogito. So it's just a matter of including the proper add-on to achieve some capabilities. And the same for persistence. So it's not the focus of this presentation, but uh, our workflow can be uh, stateful as well. So in each step of the process execution, we need to save the state of the process. So for these, we need persistence to be enabled. And we provide out of the box a set of uh, persistence add-ons to be compatible with PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL MongoDB, InfiniSpan, for instance. So uh, uh, these, uh, these kind of add-ons are provided to users out of the box as well. Another point going to the cloud native approach is that Cogito is meant to be compatible with OpenShift and Kubernetes. So it's very easy to deploy, to build and deploy in the cloud using Cogito. And uh, in the end, I put here that it's, I think it's the, one of the great benefits is that we have a set of, of tooling around Cogito. So if a user wants to design a process or a decision using DMN, there are multiple ways to do this. And for instance, we have a VS Code extension that I'll show to you later but it's a way to design a process inside VS Code. But we have different channels. For instance, we have the .new approach that probably you already seen in, in other uh, presentations here in, in Key Lives, uh, that provides a way using the browser to create and to edit and to model a process, a decision, and so on. So uh, this, this kind of stuff will, is, uh, is given to the user out of the box as well using Cogito, okay? Uh, so yeah, th this this is more to show that the idea behind Cogito is to integrate in your architecture some microservices built on the top of Cogito. So imagine uh, that you have already run, uh, some microservices that are running there. So you can create a new microservice using Cogito, and these microservices should be able to communicate with other microservices in the architecture, and even with the supporting services that Cogito. Cogito provides to the users out of the box. So let, just to mention, we have a, a service that it's called Data Index, that it's responsible to, in, to index uh, aggregating data and allowing users to, to perform queries on the top of uh, executed processes, for instance. And this is used for the tooling that we have around it. So we have the management console that allows users in a, in a UI, in a user interface, to, to visualize what processes were executed, what are the status of the, the executed processes, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we have quite a, a distributed architecture that is the whole idea behind Cogito. Okay, okay, so now we, we talk about uh, microservices, stateless, and Cogito. So what is a state straight through process? It's basically a, a special kind of process that is stateless. So with this kind of process, basically, we don't uh, store any information of the execution of the process. The idea behind it is not to include any wait state. So what is a wait state in a workflow, in a process? It's basically a, a, a step where we need inputs from outside. So let's say we are we are executing a process and at some point we need to wait to receive a message from a, from a Kafka topic. 
So this is a weight state. So we are, if we include this kind of um, construct in our process, we are including a weight state. So in a straight through process, process we don't we, we can't add any weight state in, in the process. Okay. In this way, we can totally remove persistence. And then we can say this this process that it's running on the top of Cogito is a stateless process. We don't need persistence. So we can totally remove the persistence layer, keeping everything that we need inside uh, the same request. Okay. So it behaves like a, a request and response uh, serves. So once the user sends a request, it executes a process, and in the end, it returns a response. That's in summary, that's it. Okay. Um, so here, as I said, uh, we, the user are not allowed to include any weight state. And uh, when designing process, it's common to have different uh, constructs that includes weight states. For instance, user tasks, for instance, uh, message events, signal events. Uh, so when designing a straight through process, we need to keep in mind that it's basically a way to design a process. So when you are designing the process, you, you, you should pay attention to not include any weight state in this process. Otherwise, it won't be a straight through process, OK? But uh, given this, uh, we can uh, use, for instance, error events. So we can control the errors inside the process execution using the error events. We can use gateways to choose the path that, uh, that should, should uh, go into the process execution. We can use service tasks that executes um, operation synchronously, OK? So we send a request and wait for the response. And in the, in the same flow, uh, we have this, uh, this response, OK? So it's fine. Uh, we, we can uh, use the REST work item tasks. That is basically an out-of-the-box test that allows users to send a request to an external service and receive the response, and then use the, the outputs of this task in the process execution and so on. So even though you know, we, we have this restriction, we can design quite a lot of use cases using uh, straight through processes. And I think one of the most important part is that it's very easy to integrate with decisions. So even when we are designing a process, we can leverage decisions. So either using DMN or DRL, for, for example, inside the process, we can call a decision to evaluate um, data and given an output of this evaluation, we can move on in our process and choose a path using a gateway. I'll show you later in, in an example to be easier to, to visualize this. Okay. Um, regarding messaging, I know that it's very important for us to, to handle messages in, in a microservices architecture. So we can achieve some use cases using messages in a straight through process. For instance, we can publish a message. There's no, there's no issue because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a sync uh, operation. We send a message and that's it. We can move on in our process. The problem is to include an event uh, to, to receive a message because this is a wait state. So we cannot uh, receive any task inside the process execution. Okay. But, one, one other use case, it's basically to start and then end, end a process using messages. This is fine because, for instance, I can trigger a process to be started using message. And then in the end of the process, I can publish a message as a response. So that's fine. It's a single operation that uh, runs from the start to the end in a single request. So that's fine. No wait state. Okay. so. Given all of these uh, restrictions and information of what is a straightful process, what, what kind of use case uh, we can solve using this? So I think the most important and most common use case would be to coordinate or to orchestrate calls to different services. And this, these services could be decisions or even any other external service. So it's fine to, to orchestrate REST calls in a process. So it's a very useful case for a straight through process. Uh, when we have, uh, given that the request should be processed at once, so from start to the end, we should execute the whole workflow, it should have a, a low response time. 
So if we are designing our process and then we realize that it's taking too long to be executed, probably it's a smell that uh, this process should be a stateful process. We should design it including wait states because for this use case, we, we, are, we have long running operations. It's better to include wait states in this way uh, it performs better and then we can track each step of the execution. So it's fine. So when it's kind of uh, a requirement to have a low response time from the start to the end to design a straight through process, okay? So if you have a low response time and then we, we can scale well because it, it's a stateless microservice. So it's, as we said before, it's easier to scale, to add more instance and to remove instances. So we can achieve a high throughput of this kind of process. So it's very useful when we have this situation. We need a high throughput that we have a low response time, then it's a great fit for straight through processes, okay? Okay, so uh, now let's take a look in some examples uh, to show it uh, how it works in practice, okay? So I'll show you two examples that are under Cogito examples repository. Then the first one, uh, it's basically an example where we show how to run decisions inside the same process service. So we, 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 run to, we run together the process and the decisions inside the same instance of that service, okay? And the other uh, example, it's basically the same, but instead of you running the decisions embedded, we go to a distributed approach where we are running the decisions as different microservices. But under the hood, the process would be basically the same, the same logic, okay? Uh, we have here a documentation that it has more details about uh, how to develop this kind of uh, process and, and integrating the decision. Then you can take a look later on to get more details. And then another thing that I'll show in these examples, it's basically how to deploy a service, a straight through process using OpenShift and the developer sandbox that we have uh, for OpenShift, okay? Okay, so going deeper uh, inside the example, okay? So this is the process that I, I use on this uh, example. That's basically a process to control a traffic violation. That, so the input here, it's basically uh, a driver ID that represents a driver in our system and a violation information. So let's say this driver, uh, we have a, a violation that it was detected for this driver. So first, I uh, included a service task here, the, this first step. That's basically given a driver ID, it fetches for some driver information. So to make it simple, this is just a mock service, but it could be anything. It could be accessing another microservice uh, using REST or whatever, or even accessing a database table to, to get this information. But to make it simple, I'm just returning uh, some mock of, of the driver. And then the next step would be to validate the license to check the expiration date of the, the license to say, oh, this is a valid license or this is an expired license. If the license is expired, then we finish and end the process. Otherwise we move on and then we in fact evaluate the violation. So given the driver information and the traffic violation information, we run a DMM service that it's basically the same um, decision that we already have in under Cogito examples that checks if the, the driver is suspended or not. And then we finish uh, and then the process, given the, the, the driver was suspended or not, just logging the information here. So uh, what's important to say is that the, the decision evaluation is executed locally as a method call, okay, under the same service. And if you take a look, after all the decision, we are including a point of decision that it's a gateway. So basically given the output of, the, of a decision, we move on in our process, choosing a path to go, okay? So this is a common use case uh, when using decisions, okay? Um, let's see, yeah, so here uh, I just put some information about uh, each of the, the tasks. So as I said, 
the, the get driver details task, it's basically mocking some information uh, about the driver. The license validation, as I said, is a DRL that is checking if a DRL, uh, if a license is expired or not, and the traffic violation DMN. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. So let, let's move here to uh, Visual Studio Code to show. So here, as I said, here is the the extension that we have in Visual Studio Code to design processes and. We have the same for decisions. So here is the, the violation decision that I, I showed to you before. So if you take a look here, it's a DMN. And here we have the DRL as well, that as I said to you, uh, is just check, it's, it's a simple rule that is just checking if the license is expired or not given uh, the driver information, okay? That's it. So here, yeah. So, okay, so let's run it to see if it's working. Yeah. So this is a Quarkus application and let me, okay. So this is a Quarkus application and then we can run in the dev mode, okay? So let's run this and let's open Postman. So here is the payload that I'll send to interact with this process. So as I said to you, Pro Cogito already provides um, and a set of APIs to interact with the process out of the box. So no code is needed by the developer, and then you can interact with the process using REST, okay? So um, let's see here. So this is the local. So if you, if you see here, I'm sending a request to localhost under port 88 slash traffic. Traffic is the name of the process that I created, okay? And I'm sending this payload, as I said, I have the driver ID and the violation for that driver, okay? So when we execute this, basically it runs a uh, Quarkus here and under the hood, you see, it was executed, the process, and this is the output of the process. So yeah, with this information, the all the decisions and the process were executed and the suspended information, it's no, okay? So the driver was not suspended. Let's see what it happens if we change the, the, lead, the speed that was in the violation to a higher number. So now uh, the driver was suspended because uh, we increased the, the speed. So, um, okay, so it's running. So if, it, if you see, it's a request and response approach. We execute, the process starts, execute all the decisions, and the, in the response, we have the result. So no state is stored. We don't need persistence at all uh, behind the scenes. So it's fine. Okay, let's go back now to the presentation here. Okay. So okay. So given this uh, approach using embedded decisions, basically we have our service, our application here that it's a single microservice. So if you want to scale it, we just, we, we, we can scale, but we need to scale the whole application. So we need to scale the process itself and all the decisions because they are running inside the same application. And this is fine. I mean, there's no problem with it. Mainly if our process, it's a simple process with just a few steps, okay? But there are some situations that we want to decouple things and run the decisions outside the process. So we can scale each one of them in a different way, okay? So let's move to, to the next example then. That it's this one. So if you take a look here, it's basically the same, the same process, but the difference is instead of using the, the embedded approach with a business rule task, that is a special task that executes, executes the decision in the same process, we are using a service task here that we can do whatever we want. In this case, we are sending a REST request to the decision service. So the idea is to deploy the process service and the decision service in the, as different applications and interact with them using REST. That's the, the, the whole idea and the whole difference uh, regarding the two examples, okay? 
So let, let's go here and see. Okay, so that's the main difference here. So now instead of a local method call and a, a unique service, we have different services communicating with each other using REST and they can scale and be deployed independently in the cloud, for instance. So it's more a uh, microservices architecture way of do, doing things, okay? So for this example, to make things more interesting, I'll show you this, uh, this flow that it's basically. How can we build our application? Because when we are building things locally, okay, it's fine and it's easy to develop, but how this could work in practice when going to production? So here is an example to show how we can achieve this very easily using Cogito and using OpenShift Sandbox. That it's very handful for developers because it's free. Uh, I'll show you here how how this works. Okay, let me see here. Uh, yeah, so here is the probably you can see here. Here is the the web page of Red Hat developers. So here it's where the the developer once it ha you have the the account created, you just log in and then you you can have easily a sandbox for you. That it's a, a cluster of OpenShift in the cloud for free. And then you can test and run. I think pods uh, are deleted after some hours, I think 12 hours, something like this. But the idea is to, to use it to test your applications running, in fact, in OpenShift in the cloud. And then you can see how, how it works in practice, OK? So I'll use this to show how, how easy it is to, to deploy, to build and deploy a Cogito service in OpenShift. Uh, okay, so okay, so so here, so just just to give more information about the process itself. So uh, the first here, here is me, the developer. So first, I need to build, and I I, I just need to build and to push the image that it's built during the process into some container registry. In my example, I'm using Quay.io from Red Hat. That is a container registry. Uh, so how, how I can achieve this? I'll show to you here uh, that it's very simple because since we are, uh, we are running a Quarkus application, we can just include a dependence, for instance, here that generates the image for us locally. And then we can, let me show to you, where is my terminal here? Yeah, so here, let's see. So here I'm running Maven clean install. Close this one because we don't need. So here I'm running Maven clean install normally, but I'm passing more information when building. So since I want to, no, yeah. So since I want to to publish the generated image to Cray.io, I need information where is the endpoint of my container history? What is the user? What's the password that I should use to, to, to authenticate when publishing the image? So this kind of information. So here, it's a couple of uh, properties that I'm setting when building, okay? So yeah, I don't know if this will take a while, but uh, the idea is once I build uh, the, pro the project here, it will publish the image under Quay.io, because I configured to do it. And Chia. here, uh, I'm accessing Quay.io. And if you take a look, here is the, the repository that I configured to publish the image. Tiago, just uh, and, uh, one question uh, around the process and the return. So when you execute the process, is it returning all the process variables? Or how do you choose which variables it is going to return? Well. The default approach is to return all the variables that we are defining in the process because they are public. If you don't want to, to expose, we can tag the variables to be private. In this so way, it won't, be, right? yeah, it won't be returned. Perfect. Yeah. So but, it's but, based but, on the yeah. metadata on the process variable. Okay. Yeah, awesome. the tags. Yeah, the tags. Mm. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, so, yeah, so here is the Quay.io repository. 
And then here I can see that I deployed an image here. Uh, actually, I pushed an image to, to Quay.io under the repository that I created. All the, this information is set either using uh, properties while you're building Quarkus, or you can set the, the, the properties under the application uh, dot properties as well. So uh, as, as usual in a Quarkus application. So if you see here, this is the image name that I configured, process, decision, rest, Quarkus, right? And then if we go here, this is the same. And this is the tag. I, I just tagged as latest, um, and then this can be configured here. So here we can put versions or whatever we want uh, to, to distinguish two different uh, images, OK? So that, that's it. I mean, with just this information, I can build and push the image to Quay. What is the next step? That it's a deploy uh, to OpenShift. So let me show to you here. Uh, yeah, so here is the my running instance of OpenShift. So it's, it's on the sandbox. Okay, uh, I'm running the this instance. So I have um, this namespace here that is uh, used for development, and I want to show to you the pods. So okay, so now I don't have any pod running. Okay, what I need to do is basically to deploy. I want to deploy that image that I I built before. In Cogit, uh, the, the in OpenShift, okay. So let's let's see how we can do this. I created a file that's yeah. So I created this file here, process decision YAML. That is the descriptor used uh, by OpenShift or Kubernetes or to deploy our application. So let me open here again, just to 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 show to you. What uh, is the content of this YAML? Mm -hmm. Here, here is the YAML. So basically, as a as a traditional uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes application, first uh, I'm declaring the deployment where I can set the image that I want to deploy. Okay, and then I can I'm setting in some environment properties that will be used when this, uh, this application will be deployed uh, in OpenShift. After that, I'm declaring a service for that deployment, exposing the proper prop uh, ports, OK? And then here is a route, because I want to expose my process to the external world, because I want from my machine to access the service that it's running inside the cloud uh, on OpenShift, right? So I need to expose this route under a load balance, OK? So that's it. I have the role declaration, and then I have the other services. I have one deployment for the validation, the, the decision validation. I have the service to go with that. And then I have the violation service as well, uh, declared here in the same way to allow the communication between them. OK. OK, so now that we define the deployment uh, file here, the descriptor, we need to apply it to OpenShift. We need to say, oh, OpenShift, deploy this for me, OK? How can we do that? So uh, we can use the OpenShift client to, to apply that file. So I, I want to say oh, OpenShift, apply this, this file for me in the, in the cluster, OK? And basically, it's, it's reading the YAML, and then it's communicating with the, the cloud running the OpenShift instance running the cloud here. As you can see, the pods were were created. Uh, actually, they are being created. So it's running, running, running. So everything is running. So I have one pod for the validation service, another pod for the violation, and I have two instances of the process because uh, it's it, it's as easy as this. I, I, I said the, the replicas to be two. We could set the replicas to be three, for instance. And then we could do apply, and then we we would have three instances running instead of two. Okay, so very easy to to scale. Uh, okay, so now it's running. Let's see. Uh, 
under the network, we have the services that we define in the, on the YAML. They are here. The route, yeah, the route is here. Is the one that it's exposing the process service to the outside world. So in this way, I can access from from my laptop here the instance that is running there. So based on this route, uh, we have this endpoint that it was generated. So it's just a matter of using this endpoint when sending the requests here to my process. So if you see here, now instead of using localhost, I'm using the endpoint of the route that it was created, OK? And here is my process uh, that I'm using in that example. OK, so yeah, that's it. Basically, that's it. Should work. Yeah, so that's it. So now the, the process and running it's on OpenShift with the decision as different microservices communicating to through REST. Okay, that's it. It's running there. It's the same. The process. So I can change here the the speed and see if uh, it run. Yeah, here it's not suspended. Yeah. So it's but it's basically this a similar approach running embedded or in a distributed way. And it is very easy to achieve this with OpenShift running the cloud, and then we can scale easily and so on. OK. Let's back to the presentation. Yeah. OK. So we, we saw everything running on OpenShift. Yeah, this is slide I put here because I think it's worth mentioning to you. It's how we can map data to allow the communication between processes and decisions. In this case, a uh, process and a DMN. So Cogito provide, provides to user an out-of-the-box data mapping using JSON and JSON. So in this example, if you take a look here, in my DMN, I have a data type defined for violation. And then you can see that, OK, you have the code, the date, the type, and the speed limit, and the actual speed. So in a process, we define the, the schema for data as a, a, a traditional Java bin. So uh, we have the code, the date, the speed limit. So what if we want to, to, to make the same attribute here compatible with the DMN? So we have speed, space, limit. So we can just use Jackson annotations here, like speed, space, limit as an annotation. And then under the hood, what we do in Cogito is to use uh, JSON to make this communication to work. And this is very cool because since we are using JSON everywhere, it does not matter if the decision are running embedded or using REST, because under the hood, both are translated or using JSON and JSON. So our process basically is the same. So as you see here, this is the embedded approach. And then we have the, all the data defined for this process. And here is the REST approach. It's a pretty similar, uh, almost identical process. And the data that is defined in the process is the same. So it's very cool and very easy to make both to work uh, Simply, let's say. OK, so just to wrap up uh, this presentation, uh, as, we, as we saw during, during here, uh, stateless microservices are very useful for some use cases. They are lightweight, OK, and very easy to scale. And then we don't insert any dependence for an external database, right? It's, and once we think about Cogito, it's very useful useful to achieve the, the stateless microservices approach using Cogito if we go to a straight to process. Because as we saw, we don't require any persistence to be enabled to make a straight to process to work, OK? We can leverage all uh, decisions, features, capabilities that we have in Cogito. So it's very easy to define a, a service using decisions and include these decisions inside a process execution flow. So it's very easy. It works uh, uh, seamlessly, as I uh, showed to you, the data mapping, how it works using JSON and so on. So it's very cool to, to, to use both together, processes and decisions. 
it's worth mentioning that we, we, sh we should pay attention that this kind of process and microservices should be should have a quick response time. As I said, if you, if we are designing our process or you are designing our microservice and we have a, a high response time, a long running operation, so probably it, it's an indication that we need to design this in a stateful approach where we can save state of the execution uh, of the step of the execution. So that, that's basically it. It's very useful for service orchestration. So as I showed to you here, we are orchestrating our decisions. We are calling decisions uh, during our process. It could be any other service. Here we are calling a decision, but it could be another microservice that it's not a decision, but it's defined somewhere else. No problem. I mean, it works in the same way. So it's very easy to orchestrate calls to different services using a straight through process in a synchronous approach, not in an AC. Okay. Uh, Cogito provides to us uh, uh, cloud native capabilities. So as I told you, it's very easy and it's very light to build and to deploy in Kubernetes or OpenShift uh, our application using Cogito. So we, we don't need uh, a lot of code, a lot of stuff to make it work. It's very, it's very simple. And uh, the last thing I think uh, what I want to present to you, it's a useful tool that should be included in the toolkit of, the, of you as a developer or an architect, because you, you need to analyze your use case and see, can I fit a straight to process in this scenario? If so, here's the tool. You can use Cogito and make it work easily. And I think that's it. Awesome. Great presentation, Thiago. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, bring you one question that you have uh, in the chat. Um, for REST approach, I have seen micro, micro profile is being used to invoke. Does that mean the REST palette will not be used for Cogito? Yeah, that is great, right, Tiago? Because I saw on the Cogito examples mm -hmm. that we have different ways to use, like with service yeah. tasks, with business rule tasks. So I think it is interesting yeah. to mention the different scenarios. Yeah, uh, let me try to open here. But right, I showed to you here the implementation of a process using service tasks. So let, let me show here. Let's open this the service task here. So here I, I, I'm calling a DRL service, right, using REST. So how, I, how I'm doing it? So I'm using a service task. Then I'm defining a Java class that I should provide. And the process will use this service under the hood. The operation is the method. And here I can uh, assign the input and the output of this method call. So, OK, so here is the license validation, right? So I can go here. Yeah, so basically, this is a, a Quarkus application. So I'm using the Quarkus REST client here to define the call to, to the decision as simple as this. So here I'm saying that I should uh, send a request to this path here. And this is a post operation. And these are the parameters. OK. And here is the service that it's injected in the process when it's being executed. So it's just this using service tasks. OK. But uh, the question was about how can I do it using the REST work items, right? This one, I have another example here. Let's open it. Yeah, so basically here, it's the same process, but instead of using a service test, I'm using a REST work item test. That it's basically a special uh, test out of the box that we can provide to users that would make things uh, with less code, let's say. Because here I'm saying, oh, I want to do, let me show this is this is the test. So I'm, I'm creating this task and I'm setting here basically all the information as inputs to execute the task. So in, the, in here uh, we have the URL parameter, we have the driver, we have the, the roast that I should set and so on and so forth. So they are not mandatory, all of them. But uh, if you want to provide uh, 
a password and user to be used to perform some authentication when executing the REST request, it will be used uh, out of the box. So this approach, let's say it's a low code approach. I don't need to provide any Java class to perform this operation. Cogito will uh, execute this for us out of the box. So that's the main difference. Uh, the other uh, approach with the service tasks, and this one requires user to define a Java class, as I showed to you here, to perform the operation. So that's the main difference. So it's it's just two choice. I mean, in, in the end, it's up to the user to decide what is the, the better fit for him. And that's it. Yeah, makes sense. Flexibility. Sometimes yeah. you, you go fast with just the, the service test that yeah. will code. And sometimes you don't have any set up already, uh, yeah. already in place and you need it's easier to go in the UI and just yeah uh, there's one important thing is that going to the service task approach it's easier to customize stuff when for instance running the cloud because for instance here you see uh here is the Quarkus REST client configuration so basically I, I'm setting here uh, a violation URL validation URL that when running in OpenShift here, let me show. Yeah, when running here, I'm injecting the service name inside uh, that environment variable. Okay, so let me see. Do I think it's. Here? I think that you have have to minimize your VS Code to minimize a little bit that. Uh, yeah, the glitch. Ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, now it's yeah. better. And you have to so, increase the font size too. Thank you. OK, so you see here, I have the validation URL that was used in the deployment of the application that basically I'm setting here the, the endpoint of the running of the running service. In this case, the violation and the validation service. That is all of this is defined in the YAML file. But here I'm showing the UI, the OpenShift UI, um, this information. but. Uh, you see, the, the, I'm just injecting the service names here, but all of these were defined in the in the YAML file here. Yeah, you see. Basically, basically we are talking about using best practices for developing uh, cloud native applications. We are leveraging not only the externalization of configuration that is one of the practices in the twelve factor apps. But we are also leveraging standards like the microprofile config, like microprofile REST mm -hmm. client. So it is pretty based. Uh, it, we are just uh, providing decoupled solutions, not that does not leverage specifically everything tied to Cogito, but yeah. specifically the the business process execution and runtime. So that is awesome. Thank you, Chad. Yeah, yeah. To us. yeah, that's it. And basically. Uh... I, I'd say that using the, the work item, REST work item handler, it's a, it's a low code approach and it's more difficult to customize. And using service task, on the other hand, it, you need to code, mm -hmm. and that, but you, you, are, you, you can use whatever you want. So yeah. here I, I'm using, yeah, I'm using a REST a client for Quarkus, but I could be using different mm -hmm. clients to perform and, the operation. Uh, one that's it, it's up to the user. One comment that Donato shared on the chat is that it would be nice to have an option to use environment variables, even for Cogito work item handler. I think that it would be yeah. a good uh, thing to think about using, for mm -hmm. example, system properties uh, or using Java uh, classes to get these environment variables. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to check later if that works. And if it mm -hmm. does already, then it's great. <laughs> if not, we should definitely consider it. Yeah. Yeah. So That's awesome, good. yes. Okay, great. Seems that uh, we have no more questions in the chat. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, Thiago. It was very helpful. Uh, have a good understanding of how we can take advantage of STP in our architecture. So especially in the cloud that we can scale in multiple instances, records yeah. as you showed us. It was fantastic. Thank you very much for that. That's nice. Uh, it, it was a pleasure to present to you guys. And let's see you in other lives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See you on the next uh, on future key lives, Thiago. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much, Thiago. And okay. uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead.
No, now it's your turn, Karina. Oh, I am a bit tired because I am, uh, yeah, working during the night, working with uh, the other region. So it's a, uh, it's a cool week, to <laughs> say the least. So thank you so much for being here with us today. It was a pleasure. And see you next week. What can we expect for next week, Porcelli? Yes, yeah, so next week we will have a launch in here. So we have a, a, a launch of a new tool that we are uh, shipping now. So <laughs> awesome. I'm look, looking forward for that. So see you next week, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Don't forget, like and subscribe. Same time, same day. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.